Hello, this is Father Louis Skirty with Friends of the Word, and I'm here at Ville Walsh, which is the provincial center for the Maestri P. Filippini, Teaching Sisters Filippini. And I have two very dear friends, Sister Helen and uh, Sister Mary Beth, who will inform us as to who the Filippinis are and why I'm interviewing them this year, which is a very important year. I'm Father Louis Skirty. I'd like to introduce Sister Mary Beth and Sister Helen. Okay, uh, well, why are we here? What's what's so special about this year regarding your foundress? And maybe we can talk about who she is as well. Well, Lucy Filippini was born January 13th, 1672. So that makes this the 350th anniversary of her birth. And so worldwide, all the Filipinis are celebrating it in various ways. We recognize the holiness of this woman, the fact that she was so ahead of her time in her care and compassion, in her work for women mm. and for girls who were not getting educated in a society that was sometimes corrupt, sometimes mm ignorant and so the work of the schools her work in parishes really became important to helping to reform the society that cardinal barbarigo the head of the diocese wanted to do wow okay let's go backwards now uh give me something about we're talking about saint lucy filippini give me something about her maybe family history or her background okay her parents were of the wealthier class in Corneto Tarquinia, which is on the southwest side of Italy itself. Uh, it's Tarquinia. And her mother will die when she's only 11 months old. Oh. Her father dies when she's six years old. So she, her brother and sister get adopted by their aunt and uncle who will raise them and educate them. So she had a, a, a childhood that in a way was suffering and yet in a way was full of love and more than anything was full of faith mm -hmm. you know her they were a religious family she as a child very religious would set up little altars to the blessed mother oh. whom she adopted like a mother oh that's she, great she um would uh, by the time she was 12 she was teaching ccd in her parish and so she how does that ever happen I mean, well, the, the priest had enough confidence in this 12-year-old. Yeah, she, well, again, because she was from the wealthy class, she was educated. Oh, okay. She'd okay. been studying at the monastery of Santa Lucia, which is in, Montefi in Tarquinia. And so she was very much involved in her parish. Oh, so yeah. he had her teaching. And this is 1700s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's late amazing. 1700s. We, we hadn't even been found as a nation yet. <laughs> right, wow. right. Yeah, she... Uh, was amazing, you know, and so impressed her pastor that when the new cardinal head of the diocese came, he introduced her to the cardinal and the cardinal said, let's continue your education in Montefiascone. I think he foresaw the possibilities really? of what she could do. And that do. was Barbarigo? Right. And okay, now I've known the sisters Filippini all my life because I went to a Filippini school, Holy Rosary in Georgia City. And all over the mother house and all over even in, in Italy in Rome where we just came back from Barbarigo Barbarigo is his name his face is right. all over sure. he's very special oh yeah they're trying to get his canonization process moving yeah. oh. so uh, we've had meetings with the postulators trying to promote it uh, we're waiting to see the bishop of the Montevascione Viterbo area right. has to present the case more formally. So that I think is in the process right yeah. now. Yeah. Are you involved with that process? Right now we're just waiting for the miracle. And there is one miracle of a young boy in Boston who was in a car accident with his mother. 
and oh. he did almost die and they um, they have all the paperwork and everything and it's been submitted so we're, they're just waiting to see and if that goes through because he's venerable so it'll and be attributed yeah, to him. oh wow that's great, great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. and for our audience um, when you go into the Basilica of St. Peter's in Rome it, it's overwhelming first of all you all know that sure. the first statue way up on the top area of the clear story niches is St. Philip, St. Lucy of Philippine. Philippine. Yep. So she's well, well respected in the church. So what was Cardinal, um, how did I say his name? Barbarino. Barbarino. What was his goal with her? Well, his goal was to reform his society because he real, rec- first of all, he wanted to educate his priest. So he okay. started a seminary of top class. Mm. Then he said, okay, now I got to work on the society. I'm going to work with Lucy, who's a great teacher. Uh, she had been working with Rose Venerini, who has already been declared a saint now. And so the two of them were starting these schools in the Montefiascone Diocese. Mm-hmm. Cardinal dies in 1706. Oh. So Lucy is now left to find funding for the schools, to visit all these schools she had founded within her lifetime 52 different schools so she was all, really all in italy yeah. all in italy uh from the area the tuscany area all the way down south below rome so uh it was important then to uh, get the support she needed the papal almoner who was a friend of saint lucy's friend princess altieri will be the one to uh recommend that Lucy come to Rome and meet Pope Clement XI. Wow, he to, becomes, to place her in little historic spots. That's yeah. interesting. She met with Clement Pope Clement XI. XI, and he will say, okay, I want you to start schools in Rome. So that was like leaving the Montefiasco and the diocese the first time. Who was with her? Who? How many sisters joined her community? Well, she had one or two in almost every school. At and least. Had she founded the religious order? Well, yet? technically, she became the superior general in 1704. Oh. Cardinal Barberigo appointed her. Okay. So she was the head of the order when he died. So she, they had to write up a rule, get it approved by Rome, and then it was okay, train the sisters, move them, put them around where we need them. And and you're, um, as far as uh, our audience is concerned, there's, there's, there's nuns, there's sisters. What classification are the Maestric the Filipini in? You're not nuns, right? No. Uh, I was just talking to my students about that good, the other good. day. We are considered a society of apostolic life because the Congregation for Religious mm-hmm. separates orders and then those who are in the societies of apostolic life which is what we do. Uh, We don't take vows, which at the time in the 1700s would have limited you to life in a monastery. Right, right, right. So we take what's called an oblation, which is like a promise of, you know, the same poverty, chastity, obedience, Mm -hmm. uh, but with the purpose of becoming perfectly conformed to Christ. Mm-hmm. So it's a different kind of legal binding so that we were, as a historical entity, able to be in different places, uh, move from place to place, diocese to diocese. Right, with no restrictions. Right. Um, the, the order, the outfits, the, the, the clothing that the women wore, the, the sisters wore, were really re- reflective of the period, right? It was, I mean, if you see a picture of... Lucy. <laughs> Maybe Western <laughs> United States uh, women wearing the same, yeah. not cap. all in black, yeah. the same cap, the, the hood. Yeah. Um, describe that. Uh, now you don't wear that now. It's no. been modernized. <laughs> well, what had happened was when Barbarigo, the cardinal, decided to start this community, he and a priest designed the habit. The dress was very similar to the cassock a priest wore oh, with the anise. Right. Okay, uh, the cap and the sunbonnet was similar to what women, because we weren't nuns, right. we weren't confined to hide the hair, change the names, uh, and so we were really almost not even recognized as religious nuns. Right, you know, right. we were considered teachers. 
Maestri. Maestri. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's interesting to me. In, in Rome, when you walk the streets, if a child sees you, if a sister goes by with a veil, they'll say suore. But if I walk by with my bonnet, they'll go maestro. They, oh, they, they, they know. Isn't that interesting? Know the That's yeah. fascinating. It, it is. It, it struck me a lot when the first time it happened. The yeah. kids do. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Our kids here don't see don't that know the difference. Because to explain it to our kids here, they wouldn't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it takes yeah, a yeah. bit because right. their exposure is limited. So St. Lucie's main focus was education. Well, uh, because... That's where the cardinal saw the greatest need. He felt if we can educate the child and work with the parent, the mother mostly, then we're going to reform the families and have a society that's healthier mm. and holier. Mm. Sister, ex explain to audience Maestri P, the, those words. Maestri P, a maestri is teacher, and P is holy, and holy. And because St. Lucy was so good, she would walk the streets and the people would call her, oh, here comes a Maestri P, here comes a holy teacher. Uh, oh, interesting. And uh, Magari, we are also holy teachers too. Yeah. That's, that's what we try to be. Yeah. That's great. And you lived in Italy for yes. several years. Yes, Sister Helen and I. I, I yeah, together? I, no, no, not no. together. I preceded her. Oh, okay. I was there for seven years, and then we had elections, and Sister Mary Beth got elected to yeah. come. I was there um, for 11 years, or 12 years, with Sister Mary DeBacco. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I then um, another group came in, and then um, I got back again. So. Then you've been going back and forth. Yeah, because right? we right. rotate yeah. administrations every yeah. six years. Right, right. So. Um, from the, the statutes or guidelines of St. Lucie, what still is operative and what's dropped, what's changed? If she came in today, would she recognize her? We still teach the original rule from 1707 to our young sisters because we want them to capture the spirit of what the community was all about. Of course, with the centuries, you have changes in regulations like, you know, sisters are allowed to drive, sisters are allowed to go to different countries. That was, didn't exist in the time of sure, Lucy. Sure, sure, sure. So, you know, uh, and with Vatican II, and an, an outlook on how the church saw itself influenced how the community would see itself, yes, too. Yes. So, yeah, things have changed, but basically we're so rooted in the same charism of great, the origin. Great, St. Lucy focused mainly on women and girls. And here in the United States, we still have two schools, Villa Victoria in Trenton and Villa Walsh Academy here in Morristown that are just girls. But because of the parochial system in the United States, uh, we had to adapt and where we had boys and girls from kindergarten to eighth grade. And so that's how that came about. Oh, okay, because you know? yeah. that's where I came from, the Holy Rose. Right, right. Integrated yeah. Even in Italy, the same thing. The sisters teach boys and girls. There isn't a girls' school actually in Italy at this time. Okay. But um, that was... Mother Foundress's goal. She really was wanted was out there to help the girls, you know. That's fantastic. and whenever we start a mission, usually that's who we help say, first in our missions. The, the girls. The there's girls. a lot of work good, being done good, with good. young women. And and in society, even though we're so progressive and all that good stuff, women still get low level on the totem pole. Yeah. You know, in salaries and in positions and glass ceilings, but it's it's changing. Right. Do you see that with the young women that you're working with? that they're more... Well, I find, uh, I, teaching here at our academy, I'm teaching the seniors, okay. and I teach theology. So I keep telling them, you are the future of the church right now. You are the future of our society. You can make an impact. Yes, yes. You know, don't hesitate to be strong and confident in bringing your faith to make changes in our world and our country. So they understand that. Uh, but Sister Mary Beth can tell you how hard we work in our mission countries like India and Brazil to help, and Africa, to help these girls to understand, you know, you have value. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's a good spot for us to pause on. Um, I've been interviewing Sister Helen and Sister Mary Beth on the life of St. Lucy Filippini. And of course, what happened afterwards was all the education and the schools that she had founded. We're going to continue with more aspects of the ministry of the Maestri P. Filippini. I like to say the, the Latin way, <laughs> Maestri P. Filippini. And of course, they influenced me. I had them throughout my grammar school, and I stayed friends with them through high school. And in the seminary, 
maintained close contact with all my history and many of them were at my first mass and I just showed a picture of some of the sisters, some who have passed on at my first mass. So there's a close connection. We'll be picking up with the continuation of the ministry. God bless you. This is Father Louis Skirty. Let me hear from you. Father Louis Skirty at hotmail.com. God bless you.